Hey there. It's Hazlett. Welcome to my closet studio. You just caught me playing a little John Mayer, totally unaware as you were coming in. One of the books that has had a powerful influence in my life is Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Covey. If you haven't read that book, you should. It was published in the 80s, and it, um, yeah, it's so good that it still makes bestseller lists. Uh, so what's that, 80s, 90s, aughts? You know, we're coming up on 40 years that that book has been around. It's very good, very good book. Anyways, uh, if you haven't read it, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to it. We're going to talk about the first habit of those seven habits of highly effective people. And if you have read it, you're familiar with it, then uh, you probably could use a refresher. I know that when I was preparing for this video, uh, it was a good refresher for me. The first habit is be proactive. And when you say proactive, Stephen R. Covey, he's not meaning proactive probably in the way you're thinking. I know when I first heard proactive, I thought, yeah, yeah, it means that you are doing things of your own volition. Like you are doing things without somebody else telling you to do it. I thought that's what proactive meant. And that is a use of the word proactive. But that's not what Stephen R. Covey means when he says be proactive. What he means is that you should be actively choosing what you make of your life. Um, and you can, between stimulus and response, humans have the ability to choose their actions. They don't have to just react. Animals react. Humans often react. But we don't have to. Oh my gosh. Somebody upstairs is playing with my keyboard. <laughs> so I have a wireless keyboard and mouse and uh, the mouse I'm using to control like my teleprompter, if you will. And the keyboard is sitting upstairs on the desk and one of my kids the screen started going crazy and one of my kids uh, had grabbed the keyboard and was just pounding away on the keyboard and uh, started writing all this stuff in my teleprompter. So my assistant here, uh, one of my kids here is helping me as my assistant, just went up to go take care of that. Okay, so that's what it means to be proactive. We're back. There's a few schools of thought about why we are the way that we are, why you individually are the way that you are. One is called genetic determinism, AKA your grandparents did it to you. So your genes decide how you behave. Another one is psychic determinism. Your parents did to you, how you were raised, your childhood experiences, you're the sum of those experiences. Then there's environmental determinism, your boss or whoever is doing it to you. COVID-19, it's COVID-19's fault. It's, you know, the city you live in sucks and that's why your life sucks. Something in your, in your environment is responsible for your situation. These are all part of the stimulus response theory. Think about Pavlov's dogs. It's the reactive model that we must react to whatever's happening. Um, we react instinctively and that's normal and because it's instinctive, that's okay. But as I mentioned, Covey talks about how between stimulus and response, we have the ability to create our own reality. One of the examples he gives in the book is a, a man named Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a Jew in Nazi Germany. Well, actually, I don't know that it was in Germany, but he ended up in custody of the Nazis. And he was in one of the death camps, as they are called. I, don't, I can't remember which one. I, I'm not sure which one. Um, could have been Auschwitz. But we know that the treatment that those prisoners received was totally inhuman, reprehensible, and unimaginable. One day naked and alone in his room, he realized that he had the power to decide how to respond to the vicious cruelties inflicted on him. He called it, Viktor Frankl called it, the last human freedom. So if you can think about that, picture that for a second. He's in prison for no reason. 
except being a Jew. And he's naked in his room and he's been brutalized. He's been tortured. He's been beaten. He's watched his loved ones and friends and just other humans around him that he's gotten to know die. And he had this epiphany, the last human freedom. He had the power to decide how to respond. He began to use mental exercises to expand his ability to control his response. Eventually, he became an inspiration of those around him, including his Nazi captors. And this is the definition that Covey gives to proactivity. As human beings, we are responsible for our own lives. We can choose what to think, what to do. We can choose to be completely reactive. And that is effectively giving up that power. I think that's pretty profound. As human beings, we are responsible for our own lives. If you think real hard about that, if your life is in a place that you don't want it to be, it's your fault. That's what he's saying. And not that it's your fault that you were born into the family you were or into the circumstances you were. That's not what he's saying. Of course, that's not any fault of your own. But what he's saying is you are responsible for your own life. You can choose. You have the power to choose. So let's talk about a little bit of the difference between reactive and being proactive. Reactive versus proactive. Reactive people are affected by external sources. The weather. The people around them their boss, their job, the city they live in. Proactive people are driven by values, carefully thought about, selected and internalized values. The response to the external stimuli is a value-based choice. I know that's a lot of like weird words that we don't use in normal speech, but this is from a book. But a proactive person, the way that they respond to something that's happening to them is driven by value, by their own personal values, by their core values. They decide how they will act. They realize that it's a choice and they choose what their response is. They don't just go with how they're feeling at the moment. They don't just snap. They make a value-based choice. So of course, bad things can and will happen to us. Things we have no control over can occur in our lives that are difficult and painful to deal with. You could be driving along normal, following the speed limit, following the rules of the road, and somebody else could slam into you and badly harm you, injure you. You could be paralyzed. That kind of thing, and it happens to people. Probably every day somebody is getting seriously hurt. But these things can build our strength of character when we choose a value-based response instead of simply reacting. Absent a mental illness, we can choose happiness over misery regardless of the forces around us. I'll give you an experience, an example of this from my own life. So I served a tour with the Canadian Armed Forces in Kuwait for seven months. And um, among other things, one of the things that really started to wear on me while I was working in Kuwait was arbitrariness, incompetency, politicking, and a severe environment of harassment. So arbitrariness and incompetency, I think, are really linked. What would happen, and they're really linked to politicking as well, but what would happen is you get... You'd get somebody who would have their little empire and they would make a decision that would affect my life. I'd have to do something a certain way just because there wasn't actually a good reason. It was just arbitrary. But it's a rule I had to, I had to follow. Now, this is normal in the military. There's lots of arbitrary things in the military. Um, but, you know, it can wear on you. And I'm, I'm in the reserves most of the time. I'm not full-time in the army. Uh, maybe if I was, it would just be something I'm used to. Anyways, incompetency. This is also rampant in the military. Um, there, it just tends... It, it, first of all, it's not unique to the military. It's everywhere. But 
there's plenty of people in the military that are incompetent, just like any job, just like your job. You probably know people that are incompetent in your job. And for whatever reason, they're lazy. They lack the ability to do the job that they were given. Like it's not even their fault. They were just put into a position and asked to do a job that they were incapable of doing. Um, whatever the reason, it's everywhere. Um, politicking. I think anytime you get an organization uh, that, you know, you start to get a few thousand people, even a few hundred people, things start to get political. And the military is no different. And it was no different in Kuwait. You had, you know, people trying to suck up to the right people, treating other people like crap, trying to climb over each other for, you know, for a gold star, sometimes literally a gold star. And the severe environment of harassment was really surprising to me. And it didn't affect me directly because I wasn't harassed. And in my organization, there was not a culture of harassment. But people in my, in, in my organization were subject to harassment. And I found this to be a real serious problem among the officers, which totally surprised me. I'm not an officer. I'm a non-commissioned member. And um, that rarely have I ever experienced any kind of harassment in the military as a non-commissioned member. Usually people are pretty good to you. Yeah, yeah, you get yelled at by your superiors when you screw up. That's part of military life. Um, but that's not really harassment. That's kind of a rough form of correction. Um, and when you're used to it, when you're expecting it, then it's, it's not a problem. It's not personal. It's not a personal attack. But the officers there, you had higher officers, like the more higher up officers, often treating their subordinate officers as if they were a subhuman speak to them like with great lack of respect. And this tended to trickle down the chain. So captains would be crapped on by majors, majors would be crapped on by colonels, and so forth. This was wearing on me. It was bringing my spirits down. It was making me increasingly cynical. Like I was just kind of down in the dumps about it. Like I was annoyed I was you know, this and this stuff happening around me really bugged me. And I'd complain about it to other people and and they would complain to me about it and we would complain together and it was great, you know, we'd, we'd rejoice in our complaining about how ridiculous things were and, oh, why can't people do something that makes sense, you know, oh, this kind of thing. So one day I woke up and I decided, okay, I'm done with this. I'm done feeling that way. Because it's doing absolutely no good. It's just making me feel miserable. And I realized I had the choice to be happy or not. And really, I didn't have a reason to be upset. Like I said, my organization that I was a part of was really good to me. I have no complaints about them. They were, they were good. And, and generally, people treated each other with respect and tried to do a good job and were competent. And so I really had nothing to complain about. So why was I letting somebody, you know, something else get me down? So I didn't. And it made a big difference. I was happier after that. I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. Another way that this can manifest itself is in personal relationships. I'll give you the kind of classic example of uh, love. So people saying that they've fell, fallen out of love, and that's why they're breaking up. And sometimes that can have real dire consequences um, when there's children involved in this type of thing. They'll say things like, I just don't have those feelings anymore. And what Stephen R. Covey talks about, and he, he uses a specific example where a friend of him said, man, I just don't know if I can do that. I just, we just don't have those feelings anymore. I think it's over. And his answer was, choose to love. Serve, sacrifice, listen, empathize, appreciate, affirm, Love the feeling is a fruit of love the verb. And I thought that was really powerful. And, and it makes sense to me that if you choose to love, as in the action of serving and sacrificing for another person, listening to them, empathizing with them, appreciate them, affirm them, support them, then naturally you're going to feel love the feeling. That's the fruit of love the verb. 
Another area he talks about being proactive is where do we spend our time? Where do we choose to spend our time and effort? So there, he talks about two circles, your circle of concern and your circle of influence. And if we spend a lot of time worrying about things outside of our control, outside of our circle of influence, and we spend a lot of time concerned about those things, then naturally we're going to feel stressed or we're going to feel helpless, like we are totally incapable of making a difference. But if we focus on our circle of influence and on growing that, the things we can change, the things we can influence, then that circle grows. You don't want it to be bigger than your circle of concern. This is really common with celebrities. They have a huge circle of influence, but they're not worried about it and they think they shouldn't have to worry about it. You should. It's irresponsible to not be concerned about your influence, the things you can control. So he, uh, he ends that chapter, that, that part about uh, the first habit, with the challenge. And I extend that challenge to you. A 30-day test. For 30 days, focus only on your circle of influence. Don't worry about the things you can't control. Instead, focus on what you can control, especially your own actions and responses to the circumstances you find yourself in. Do that for 30 days and see if it makes a difference. I hope you found this interesting and useful. Let me know if you did and if you plan on trying to implement this principle in your life. I'm always trying to do better at this, and it definitely makes a difference in my life when I do. Thanks for watching. If you want to see more content like this, like the video. And of course, ring the bell if you want to be notified as I release more content. Peace. Just go back to playing the guitar.